In my first video essay, I tried to cover what the Order of the Phoenix movie lacked, and why it failed to make the viewer invested in the characters and the story. Being a fan of both the films and the books, I naturally have to talk some more about Harry Potter. This time though, the topic is quite different. It's about something which always bothered me about the films, but that I rarely hear anyone talk about, namely the cinematography and the color grading. First, let me make it very clear. The color grading, or the color tone and the cinematography for most of the Harry Potter movies is good. It's not excellent, but it is good. The problem, or I should say, the challenge with any series of movies is trying to create a coherent and cohesive narrative. And in this case, the narrative lasts through not the typical three films of a trilogy, but eight films, each of them with a runtime over two hours. I really don't envy the producers of these films. But again, seeing as the films are based on a coherent and cohesive series of books, well, at least if you don't mind the time-turner problem and the undefined limit of what magic can and cannot do, the directors and the producers of the movies would be smart to make the movies feel like a complete narrative. I mean, when reading the books, there's no real problem in creating a coherent narrative. Our imagination does that job for us quite instinctively. Though our imagination can also be influenced by the movies. For instance, I always pictured Daniel, Emma and Rupert as Harry, Hermione and Ron. And unfortunately for me, I also only pictured Richard Harris as Dumbledore when I read the books. However, our imagination is not bound by the constricts of a camera or what the physical eye can see. The inner eye, as Trelawney would put it, sees much more, and it has the ability to make sense of what we imagine. In this way, the narrative of the books has a natural flow, not only as a result of our brains making sense of it. Of course, Rowling deserves probably all of the credit. She described the Harry Potter universe in such a way that let our imagination run wild. But with the films, this becomes a completely different story. They are bound by what the camera can capture and what the physical eye can see. Let's do an experiment. Let's say you gather a million fans of the first book before the film came out. Among them, you'll probably have a million versions or visions of how the world looks. Along comes the movie and suddenly the world in our imagination converges into what the movie portrays. Now we know what Dumbledore, Hogwarts and Diagon Alley looks like. We recognize it without actually having seen it before and we feel almost nostalgic about it. This again creates expectations. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I want to talk a little bit about cinematography and color grading and why they're such important parts of making a coherent movie. Now, cinematography is a broad term that covers every aspect of how the film looks. And on a film set, the look is the responsibility of the director of photography or DOP for short. This person has to interpret what the director wants and then capture it on camera. This involves choosing the correct lenses, framing the picture, making sure that the lighting is being captured correctly, using filters that can tint or expose the picture in specific ways, etc. This is no easy job. Color grading, on the other hand, is a more specific technique. It consists of enhancing or even changing the color of the picture. The process has existed for over half a century, maybe even longer. Up until recent years, it's mostly been done by laboratories that process entire film reels. This was and is an expensive ordeal. And the amount of control the director had on the final look of the film was in many ways limited. This meant that DOPs had a tougher job by having to capture the final output of colors and light in camera. Basically, what you record is what you get. But after the digital video era, especially the mini DV era in the late 90s and all the way up to the late 2000s, coupled with the fast growing technology of non-linear editing programs such as Adobe Premiere, the color grading process got digitalized and as a result was made way more affordable and it gave directors way more control. Hence the term, we'll fix it in post. This whole phenomenon is known as the indie film revolution 
It led to a boost in the prosumer market for so-called indie film cameras that simulated the ever-popular film look. And it's probably responsible for the dark, grudgy and gritty film look you see in films everywhere today. Hell, if you want, you can actually observe this shift taking place right here on my YouTube channel. Just go back 10 years and see for yourself. You might wonder why all this is relevant to the Harry Potter movies. Well, this indie film era is the context of which the Harry Potter movies were being made. They were made in the midst of the great divide in Hollywood between the film reel purists and the rebellious digital filmmakers. The clearest example of this divide in the Harry Potter series is when you look at the color tone of the first two movies directed by Chris Columbus, which both have a very similar and specific look, and then comparing them with Prisoner of Azkaban, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. The first two movies were released in 2001 and 2002. Prisoner was released in 2004. And just by looking at them, I think it's pretty clear that Prisoner is by far the more stylized. And in my opinion, as a purely observational point, it looks way better than the first two, hands down. It's not to say that the first two were bad though. Again, I actually think most of the Harry Potter movies had pretty decent cinematography and color grading. But throughout the years of the films being released, not only did the technology change and improve, but the cinematography changed with every director at the wheel. And that's only natural. Every director has a unique style. And as I mentioned before, this became almost shockingly apparent with Alfonso Cuaron's Prisoner of Azkaban. Both Columbus and Cuaron shot on film. And as we know, all film reels has to go through laboratories to get processed. But the most substantial difference between them is in the post-processing of the films. The Philosopher's Stone and the Chamber of Secrets had virtually no post-processing other than printing it. The film reel for Prisoner of Azkaban, however, got digitalized, giving Alfonso more control over the color grading process. Now, it's not just in the color tone or post-processing. The two directors differ vastly in style as well, but I'll get to that shortly. But what's the problem? Getting more control over the final output seems to be a great tool for directors. And yes, it is. The problem isn't the tool itself, but perhaps how it was utilized. And here we come to the crux of the matter. Alfonso's cinematography as a whole, and especially his grading choices, derailed so much from Columbus's style that, at least to me, it actually disconnected it from the narrative as a whole, and consequently it set a precedent for the future filmmakers of continual changes in the cinematography and color tone, resulting in a slightly growing disconnect for every film that came out. Just by looking at these screen caps, you could almost question whether this is the same character though that's not purely the fault of the cinematography. David Yates, who directed the last four movies, had an incredible opportunity to correct the issue. But in my opinion, he made the disconnect even greater, especially when you compare The Order of the Phoenix to The Half-Blood Prince. For example, to me, one of the major reasons why a trilogy like The Lord of the Rings feels, let's say, way more coherent than the Harry Potter saga is exactly because of this. Peter Jackson knew that to tell an epic story like this, you have to appeal to all the senses in a way that feels connected. In effect, this meant that the look of the Lord of the Rings had to be a crucial part of the narrative. And it stayed the same throughout the trilogy. The color palette, the tone, the contrast, the lighting, the camera work, the cinematography was just as much part of the storytelling as the script. One can argue though that directors and DOPs should have the freedom to be creative with this or not, but I genuinely believe that when faced with the task of creating a huge story like the Harry Potter saga is, one has to work to stay not only as true to the books as possible, but also stay true to the already established world, rather by evolving the look gradually as you go, and not by creating distinct divides between the movies. But I won't lie, 
To me, it was Chris Columbus who in many ways established the Harry Potter world. And that isn't to say that his cinematography was the best or that his color tone didn't have flaws. It did. But by being the first one to show this world to us, he converged our imagination into his vision. With his warm, bright, yet desaturated and sometimes vibrant colors, and with his camera work, it was primarily in a fixed position, that is to say, only moving occasionally, and always very controlled and stable, never shaky. And there's rarely any use of wide-angle lenses for anything other than very wide shots. His vision stayed in my mind when reading the books from then on. But Chamber of Secrets did have a slightly different color tone than Philosopher's Stone, but it had relatively the same color palette, only slightly darker. And there's absolutely an argument to be made that the color tone would naturally change for every film, seeing as the tone of the books get gradually darker from the first to the last. However, after the warm, bright and vibrant world that Chris Columbus created, in comes Alfonso, along with, and I quote, his raw naturalism. His bleak skin tones, harsh contrast, and predominantly handheld camera movements, which by the way is another indie film influence. The nerd writer correctly pointed out in his video essay on the Prisoner of Azkaban that the constant movement of the camera gave the viewer a sense of unease, which was in line with the tone of the book. Koran also used a lot of wide-angle lenses and had them set up closer to the actors, furthering the sensation of unease and gritty realism. When I first saw it in the theater, I couldn't help but feel like Koran had this need to completely distance himself from the first two movies as far as he could. Though he did say in an interview that it wasn't an attempt to distance himself, but rather that he had to stay true to himself and create his vision. And even though the components of the story were there, all I could feel was dissonance. Yes, I had seen a Harry Potter movie, but it didn't feel like it or it felt like I'd watched sort of a reboot of the franchise. To me, the tone and the style was too different. It didn't mean that I hated the movie. As a true fan, I could only bring myself to say that I didn't love it as much as the first ones. It didn't help that Richard Harris's untimely death after Chamber of Secrets led to the disastrous casting of Michael Gambon as Dumbledore. I'm sorry, but Dumbledore never grabbed Harry by the shoulders and shouted like an old grouch at him. I know a lot of people perhaps feel the exact opposite of what I'm saying here. Prisoner of Azkaban is, to many people, their favorite film, yet to me it's actually my least favorite of them all. I like it, it's a great film, it looks really good, and it implements great film techniques. So while it's a great film in and of itself, I just don't think it's a great Harry Potter film. Or it could be if the world had already been established with the same look. But as it stands today, in many ways, I do think The Prisoner of Azkaban ruined the narrative of the Harry Potter films.